How to Deal with Disrespectful Teenagers. Join me, Dr. Thomas Lamar, on this episode of Christian Heritage on Air as we welcome Christian counselor, author, speaker, teacher, and preacher, Lou Priello. For more information, visit ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. Christian Heritage on Air is a production of Christian Home Educators of Washington. This webinar recorded on June 3rd, 2014. Welcome back. My name is Dr. Thomas Lamar. I'm a homeschooling father of eight, chiropractor by trade, a guy who loves to podcast, and your host for Christian Heritage On Air, a program which looks to encourage, teach, and inspire you with biblical vision for your family and the home education process. Well, it is great to be back. Welcome once again, everybody. Glad to have you join us for yet another installment of Christian Heritage On Air as we rejoin you on the other side of the ninth Annual Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschooling Conference. And uh, wow, what a conference it was. Ken Ham did a phenomenal job, as uh, did all the speakers. And by God's grace, all the pieces fell into place and uh, families from all over enjoyed another inspiring and encouraging conference Great job, everyone. Of course, uh, recordings of all the sessions are available on the uh, Christian Heritage website, and I encourage you to go check it out, them out over at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. Speaking of conferences, uh, we've got another one in the wings, and uh, well, <laughs> you know what? I can't let this slip by. For those of you that are doing the math at home and caught my introduction, I am no longer a homeschooling father of seven, but rather a homeschooling father of eight. <laughs> And so as I sit here next to my beautiful wife who is pregnant, and, uh, we, are, we are just so excited. We're expecting uh, in November, everyone in the family uh, is, uh, like I said, excited and we're praising God. So uh, anyway, um, we move on. As I was saying, uh, we've got another conference coming uh, before year end here. And uh, actually, it's a conference that has been put together based on feedback from you, the Christian Heritage community. It's the Christian Heritage Family Relationships and Parenting Conference to be held in Ocean Shores, Washington on October 10 and 11, 2014. Come join us for a hope-inspiring, gospel-powered conference on family relationships and parenting for the whole family. Through the messages of uncompromising speakers, practical family-based panel discussions, and invigorating fellowship, we will be challenged and equipped to persevere in forging strong family relationships, which, by God's grace, will impact the world for generations to come. More information is available on our website, of course, at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. And uh, later on in the program, if our internet holds up, I plan on pulling the producer Danny Craig onto the show because it just so happens that he is the coordinator for this event. So uh, we'll get to him to tell us more. But first, uh, let's jump right into our topic tonight. And it might interest you to know that our guest will be one of the keynote speakers at the Family Relationships and Parenting Conference. So what do you do when you have a disrespectful teen? Well, according to our guest, nothing provokes parents to anger quicker than disrespect. There is something about an insolent son or daughter that upsets a parent and incites him to action. Often the wrong kind of action. Tonight, we're going to talk about this. And to help give our guests a little more insight as to who his audience is tonight, at least those of you joining us live, we're going to take a couple of poll questions. So here comes the first one up on your screen. If Danny could put that up. How big of an issue is disrespect in your home? Is it A, out of control? B, working at it, but we have a long ways to go. C, by God's grace, it's going pretty well. Or D, disrespect? What's that? <laughs> Go ahead and answer that if you could. And uh, while you are answering that, I want to remind those of you that are catching this recording on YouTube um, or as an audio podcast in iTunes that you too can join us live by surfing on over to ChristianHeritageOnAir.com and signing up to be notified of our next live broadcast. And of course, uh, while you're there, you can also peruse all of our archives and check out the ones that you may have missed. Okay, let's see uh, just how big of a difference disrespect is for our live audience. Well, it appears that uh, 8% of you say it's out of control. 54%, so the bulk, say we're working on it, but we have a long ways to go. And uh, 38% coming in by saying, uh, by God's grace, it's going pretty well. And it looks like uh, 
Everybody knows the definition of disrespect. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's go to question number two, though. Uh, and that is, if you have at least one teenager, is raising teenagers more or less challenging than you expected? So is it A, more challenging, B, less challenging, or C, just what you expected? Go ahead and answer uh, that one if you could, live audience. And as you are answering our question, I want to remind you to send us your question for our guest once our uh, interview gets underway. And you can do that, of course, at any time by simply typing into the chat box. And of course, uh, we will queue those up for the Q&A segment, which will happen a little bit later on in the par- in the program here. So is raising a teen more or less challenging than you expected? Let's see uh, how the answers came in on this one. And uh, it looks like 61% of you say more challenging, 21% less challenging, and uh, 18% just what you expected. Okay, well, I say with those answers, it's time to get time to get to work. So here we go. All right. Well, you might recognize our guest by any one of the several books he has authored, including The Heart of Anger, The Complete Husband, Teach Them Diligently, Getting a Grip, Picking Up the Pieces, and Pleasing People. In addition to his books, he has dozens of recordings extrapolated from his 27 years of lectures, teaching, and preaching. He is the editor of the Resources for Biblical Living series of booklets dealing with numerous counseling issues, and he is a fellow in the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors as well as an instructor with the Birmingham Theological Seminary. He travels frequently throughout the United States and abroad training pastors, laymen, and fellow counselors. And he and his wife, Kim, are the parents of two girls, Sophia and Gabriella. And like I said, he will be joining us at our upcoming Family Relationships and Parenting Conference. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome to our Christian Heritage on-air microphones, Mr. Lou Priolo. Lou, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. It's so good to be here. Well, we are so excited to have you on, um, and I just really want to just get right into this content because I know that a lot of people um, are interested. Lou, when we talk about uh, disrespectful teenagers, you know, some might say, isn't this just a phase that teenagers go through? You know, Lou, why is it so important that we just deal with this head on? Well, it may be a phase, but it's a sinful phase if it is, because, of course, as you know, uh, the Bible says that the first commandment with a promise has to do with honoring your father and your mother. But uh, in many cases, it is a phase that leads to uh, long-term consequences. And it's a phase that just <laughs> keeps on giving, keeps on growing like the ever-ready bunny. It's just, yeah, it's just like a cancer. Right. So maybe we should uh, just kind of, I know we, we mentioned uh, that everyone knows what dis- disrespect means, but I'd, I'd like to kind of define it um, from your point of view. What is disrespect exactly? Well, fundamentally, first and fundamentally, disrespect is an issue of the heart. Uh, and so as parents, when we think about helping our children deal with disrespectful attitudes, disrespectful words, uh, disrespectful facial expressions and um, tones in their voices, It's important to remember what Jesus said. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what I want to do first, even in answering this question uh, and defining further what I think disrespect is, is to help everyone understand that you can learn all of this great scripturally sound, high-tech, state-of-the-art uh, material on, on what respect is, how to teach your children to be respectful, how to choose the right words and train them to uh, uh, communicate the right way. But at the end of the day, because disrespect is really an issue of the heart, it's going to do you little good unless you're willing to invest the time and effort to deal with the issues that are in the heart of your child. So disrespect is first and foremost an attitude of the heart. It's rooted in the sins of pride and selfishness. It, fundamentally, it has to do with not esteeming others more highly than ourselves, as the scriptures say. It's the belief that we are wiser or smarter or cooler or otherwise better than others. And beyond this, it's not giving others the honor that they are due, in some cases, even showing disrespect for them. So um, one of the things that, that I was really intrigued by or just, it resonated with me was you said that, in, you, said that you know, so, with disrespect, 
it roots out all manner of other sins. So it's, it's like it opens the floodgates for other sins to come forth. Tell us more about that. Well, again, remember, it's rooted in pride and selfishness. And so <laughs> these two sins, when they manifest themselves in our lives, they don't usually show up by themselves. They lock arms with other sins and sort of march into our lives uh, <laughs> in a row. And so it's important that we realize that there are often other things that have to be dealt with in the heart of a child that is disrespectful. It could be contempt for authority. It could be anger. It could be bitterness. Um, it could be rebellion. There are any number of things that uh, are associated with a disrespectful attitude in a child. So when we were, we've, um, you know, we've uh, told people this is, uh, you know, how to deal with a disrespectful teenager. How does this all begin though? Um, if we have a teen that's disrespectful, is it because we've maybe made some parenting errors or mistakes earlier on in that child's training? Well, that certainly is possible. I wrote a, a whole book uh, that addressed that, uh, the heart of anger that you mentioned earlier. I, I have a chapter in it um, that's entitled How to uh, Avoid Provoking Your Children to Anger, or actually it's entitled How to Provoke Your Children to Anger. I identify 25 things that parents do that uh, are provocative. So, yes, certainly oftentimes um, disrespect uh, breeds in a home where mom and dad are pushing the child's buttons and the child becomes uh, gets hurt. Then he gets uh, rebellious, he develops an angry attitude, and then he becomes insubordinate. And somewhere, you know, between anger and, and insubordination and rebellion, the uh, disrespectful attitude occurs. But there's something else that um, I have to say, it's not necessarily the result of the parents provoking the child to anger. We live in a society where television, I mean, even good television shows, even what, what we call good television shows, even... A lot of the media and the, 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 uh, the movies that uh, parents, because of the rating, are willing to let their children go see, there's this disrespectful attitude that's communicated. Um, I've observed recently that, and this is just my opinion, I haven't proved it scientifically, really studied it, but it just seems to me as a result of my counseling that uh, after the Y generation, uh, most people don't get respect. I mean, when, when I was young, uh, you, you understood respect, you understood authority, you understood what it meant to salute the uniform and to distinguish between a person's position and their personality. And you showed respect to a person, even if that person did not require, or, or even if that person, yeah, if that person's personality did not demand respect, uh, you showed respect him because God gave a uniform. And if the uniform was six sizes too big, you still saluted the uniform. Well, well, today's generation, and I think for several generations, somehow we've lost that. And I think the influence of society, uh, the influence of friends, uh, sometimes causes teens to become disrespectful, even though they don't necessarily have a gripe with their parents. It, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about influence. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be uh, uh, will be destroyed. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good mor morals. Make no friendship with an angry man or you'll learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. So there's this influence in the society that uh, teaches our children to be disrespectful, even if they don't necessarily have a case against their parents. So, okay. So if I'm a parent, which I am, eight, um, and we're looking at our children. Um, you know, the first thing I think of when I think of disrespect is I think of maybe a, a child that's talking back to me or a, a child that, uh, you know, is just openly disobeying, but show us or uh, kind of walk us through some of the other things, some of the signs that we as parents need to look for so we can um, be more um, vigilant in, in taking care of the uh, situation. Well, there are a lot of ways uh, in which um, children, teenagers especially, are disrespectful. Um, in the book, uh, the book in which this material has been lifted is uh, called Getting a Grip. And uh, the subtitle is a Heart, The Heart of Anger Handbook for Teens. It's really a book I wrote. Uh, it's interesting. I was at a school a home educators conference in the, uh, in the Midwest. And uh, I was at the book table signing books. And these two young girls came up to me they were sisters and they said to me we read your book the heart of anger and we really enjoyed it and i said you enjoyed it people don't really enjoy that book usually they they, they find it helpful it's convicting 
Anyway, by the time the conversation was over, they asked me, have you ever thought about writing a book with the same material for teenagers? And I never thought of that before. So I thought it was a great idea. I went home, I pitched it to the publisher, and he gave me the green light, and that's where the book came from. But nevertheless, in the book, I identify several of the more common manifestations, and there are lots of them. I mean, just refusing to talk to your parents. Uh, that's a form of disrespect. Rolling our, uh, their eyes at us, raising their voices to us, calling us name, telling, telling us no. Uh, sometimes they'll threaten us. They'll look at us in an, uh, with an angry sort of look on their face. Sometimes they withhold affection. They scoff. They talk back. They use biting sarcasm. Uh, they sometimes will embarrass their parents publicly and take great delight in doing that. They slander their parents to their friends. They put them down. They ridicule them. Uh, even something as simple as not being grateful is and can be a form of disrespect. Uh, they, of course, they'll willfully disobey us, and that's a form of disrespect. Some children curse their parents. They're rude and unmannerly. Uh, a lot of kids refuse to be corrected by their parents. They interrupt them when they're talking. Uh, here's another one, attentiveness. They're, they're inattentive. They don't pay attention to their parents when the parents talk to them. Well, you got to go through the book of Proverbs and just do a little study on the word uh, attend. And, I mean, it's pretty amazing to me the number of times the Bible basically says to children, when your parents speak to you, sort of like when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens, when your parents speak to you, Write down what they're saying. Stop what you're doing. Write on the tablets of your heart. Bind what they're saying around your necks. Write them on your hands. It's like you need to basically memorize what your folks tell you to do. And in order to do that, you need to be attentive. Well, in our society, our kids are not taught to attend to us the way the Bible says they should. Of course, you know, with all of the uh, media and gadgets and different variety of screens that our children can uh, entertain themselves with, uh, you know, it's hard for a parent with just regular old communication to compete uh, for their child's attention. But nevertheless, attention is something that the Bible says children, or all of us really, but especially says children ought to do when their parents are talking to them. Um, they walk away from their parents when the parents are talking. They murmur. They complain. They make their parents out to be ridiculous or contemptible. They don't follow their parents' instructions. They compare them unfavorably with the parents of their friends. They have a condescending attitude towards them. They contradict them in front of others. So that's a, a small sampling of the kinds of ways, uh, the different ways, I should say, that disrespect manifests itself in the heart of uh, Western children. And I think if we're all honest, we can probably... Oh, yep. Seen that one. <laughs> Seen that mm -hmm. one, too. And uh, even maybe some of us have displayed those as well um, in our younger years. Um, you mentioned the media. Let's dig a little deeper into what motivates teenagers to display the disrespectful um, personality, if you are, or the dis disrespect in general. Yeah, that's a very good question. There are actually a number of things that motivate children to uh, to be disrespectful. Uh, sometimes they simply are disrespectful to divert their parents' attention. In other words, to keep from having to do what my parents want me to do. I'll just be dis disrespectful and maybe that will get them off track and I, uh, I won't have to do what I've been asked to do. Sometimes... Uh, Teenagers are disrespectful to get even with their parents. They've been offended, and so they vindictively pay their parents back for not giving them what they want. And, of course, the offense could be a real offense, or it could just simply be, I mean, it could be a sin, in other words, or it could be something that offended the children, but it's not something that the parents did. It's uh, an offense against God. But nevertheless, they were hurt. They have this perception that they were wrong, and so they vindictively pay their parents back by being disrespected because they know, as you said, as I said, as you said at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, you know, uh, very few things provoke parents to anger as much as a child that's disrespectful. Sometimes they're disrespectful to protest, basically to teach their parents that you can't teach, you can't treat me that this way. 
And so they exercise their authority. So as it were, flex their muscles to protest their parents' authority. Um, sometimes children think, well, I'm going to be disrespectful because I want to be myself. Uh, in other words, to, to help their parents see that this is just the way I am and I'm not going to change the way I talk for anyone, not even you. Some kids are disrespectful to manipulate their parents. Uh, they, they are disrespectful to evoke a sinful response from the parents so that the parents will feel guilty and give the child what he wants. Sometimes they're disrespectful to register a complaint to express disapproval for what mom and dad has said or done. Sometimes kids, uh, maybe not so much teenagers, but younger children, sometimes teens, they're disrespectful to test the limits of their parents. In other words, to see how far they can push mom and dad before mom and dad says, okay, enough is enough, you've got to stop. Sometimes teenagers are disrespectful to see who's in control, to discover, in other words, the extent to which they can manage their parents. Sometimes they're disrespectful to justify their contempt or to establish the fact that they have good reason not to respect their parents. And there can be any number of other sinful motivations. But, you know, the truth is, sometimes, as I alluded to a moment ago, that there's no real ulterior motive. It's just the way the child has learned to communicate, um, maybe uh, as a result of things he's learned in the home, maybe as a result of things that he's learned uh, as he associates with his other uh, friends. Uh, maybe it's just the way he, he developed and his parents didn't recognize it and didn't try to correct it quick enough. And so it's just become a pattern, but there's no ill intent in his heart. He just doesn't get respect. He just doesn't realize what is wrong with the way he's communicating. He doesn't understand the, the degree to which his communication really is uh, unbiblical. How much of this is the parent's fault? Well, <laughs> it may be a lot. It may not be a lot. I, I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, Again, I, I talk actually in, in the book, Getting a Grip in the Heart of Anger, I have a, a, a chapter in each one about uh, what, uh, what parents do to provoke their children to anger. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it really doesn't matter, uh, especially for a teenager, uh, how much he was provoked by his parents. I, I say that meaning not that the parents are not culpable, but, you know, in biblical times, when a person became 13 or 14 or 15, he had some kind of rite of passage and he was considered or she was considered an adult. And so at some point, no matter how much your parents may have provoked you to sin, you're a Christian now and you really are an emerging adult and God holds you culpable to change your disrespectful attitudes, to res repent of your disrespectful attitude. Even if your parents did, even if your parents continue to provoke you to anger, you're a believer, you're of age, you have a responsibility to learn how to talk respectfully to your parents. But, you know, the short answer to the question is, you know, more often than not, the parents are somehow culpable for it. Uh, so, again, when I counsel, uh, when I counsel families who, whose children are rebellious and disrespectful, my policy is I'll, I usually won't see the child or the teenager until I've had a couple, three sessions with mom and dad for the very reason of helping them identify uh, ask forgiveness for it and remove whatever they might be doing to provoke mm -hmm. the child to anger. So by the time the team comes in for the first session, which is maybe four, session number four, mom and dad are sitting there with a list of their sins in his in their hands, and the whole counseling center begins. The first time the child comes in, mom and dad are sitting there with this list of ways that they've sinned against him, and they, they read their list to him, and they ask him to forgive them for the ways that they've sinned against him. You know, and usually the kid is thinking, hmm, this is not what I expected in counseling. I thought I was going to be the one in the hot seat, but here this guy, you know, He's got mom and dad not. See, we're starting out by them confessing their sin to, sins to me. That's not what I expected. That's good. So in so the parents are, are really modeling what they're wanting to see in their, their own child. That's exactly right. And, okay. and you know, I, I know I, I've written several parenting books, and um, I think what the older you get, the more I, I realize um, we teach our children. You know, I, I've spent hours and hours with my girls uh, teaching them the Bible. But the truth is... Uh, what I've taught them by my own sinful attitudes spoke just as loudly as the, the, you know, what I unintentionally taught them by not modeling in certain areas things that I should have modeled spoke just as loud to them as the scripture that I spent hours and hours teaching them.
So it works for better or it works for worse. We, we teach our children by example. So we're going to spend the majority of our time together before we get to the Q&A. And I want to just uh, let everybody know that uh, you can ask Mr. Priolo a question by simply typing in a question to the chat box. And we'll be getting to those uh, shortly. I can see the questions already coming in on my screen here, which is great. Um, Lou, we, I, I, what can parents do to help correct this in their teen? Is, is there any hope? Is it possible? Well, of course, so if the Bible says, if the Bible says you have to honor your father and your mother, then you have to believe there's hope. God wouldn't ask us to do anything without, as Christians, without giving us all the resources that we need to, to obey him. So, you know, in James chapter one, in the very time, the kids are disrespectful. Uh, the Bible says uh, 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 God gives us the wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask him. God gives to all men liberally and a great none. It should be given him. So before you even start. You know, God promises to give you the wisdom. And then in Philippians chapter 4, he promises to give you the ability, uh, and he promises to give you the desire. It is God who works in you, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit there. God, the Holy Spirit, who works in you to make you willing and to make you able to do his good pleasure. And so, yes, what, you know, whenever you see situations that, uh, that, that are commands in the Bible, uh, that seem impossible, like don't provoke your kids to anger or bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You've got to believe, if you believe the Bible, that God's going to give you all the wisdom and the resources that you need to do what he says you can do. And it may not be easy, but like I tell my the people I counsel all the time, as Christians, we can learn to do anything that the Bible says uh, we must do. So it may not be a quick fix, but we can learn little by little to to teach our children how to deal with the issues that they face. Yes, yeah, if our children, of course, are believers, and if they're not believers, then of course, what we have to do is to evangelize them and share with them and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Very important, because um, yeah, you got to have that foundation. So, um, talk to our parents tonight, whose uh, whose children are believers, and what what is the best way to kind of start into this? Oh. The best way to start into it is to identify what you've done wrong. I mean, again, humility begets humility. And since since disrespect is really a manifestation of pride and selfishness, probably the best thing you can do is to identify the things that you've done wrong as a parent, the way you have failed, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's modeling disrespect, modeling anger, not having a good marriage. Uh, again, I have a list in both the heart of anger and getting a grip to get parents started. But the First thing I would recommend any parent do is to take an inventory of the ways that they have provoked their children to anger. Sit the kids down, and maybe individually, or maybe the whole family. You say, "Guys, look, uh, mom and I, mom and dad, I've realized that we have really, really blown it. We have provoked you to anger. Uh, we've done, we've, we've provoked you to anger by doing this, by not doing this, and and just basically begin by acknowledging the ways that you have sinned against them, and then seeking their forgiveness. And then from there, um, probably what I would, uh, or what I actually encourage people to do is to uh, explain to the children, now look, you know, we have failed to teach you respect the right way. And when we try to teach you respect, we haven't always done it the right way. So we're going to begin a program, a study of what the Bible says about communication in general and, and respect in particular, and just spend some time in the evenings or whenever you have your family time, your family worship, instructing the children on what disrespect is, what respect looks like, uh, the different manifestations of disrespect, and little by little start uh, uh, talking about from the Bible uh, what respect looks like and why respect is so important and why disrespect is such a sin such, uh, that carries such serious consequences. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That's Ephesians 6, 2 through 3. Um, Dr. Lou, tell us um, one way that you would explain that passage to a teen. Uh, well, I would say there, there, are, there are two things here. All right? There are two promises associated with this passage. Uh, if you honor your parents, it will go well with you. So there's a, there's a promise that there will be God's blessing and you'll have a higher quality of life. 
Uh, and if you don't honor your parents, the quality of your life is going to be affected, uh, diminished. And the second part of the promise that you may live long upon the earth. So the length of your life may be affected as a result of your following or not following this passage. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so... Something that that you wrote that I thought was uh, was kind of neat. You said you must learn to salute the uniform God has given us, yeah. Even if you believe it's yeah. six sizes too big, yeah. So in Acts chapter twenty three, uh, the Apostle Paul is brought into the Sanhedrin, and I like to see him on this stage with two guards, a guard on either side of him, and I like to see the Sanhedrin in the balcony. I don't know if that's how it was, but anyway, he walks in and. He's shackled between two guards, and somebody stands up um, and says, okay, Paul, you can begin to speak. And Paul begins to speak. He says, brothers, because he used to be a member of the Sanhedrin, brothers, uh, I have lived in all good conscience before God up to this day. Well, somebody stands up and says to one of the guards next to Paul, uh, excuse me, would you please punch him in the mouth? And so the guard punches him in the mouth. And Paul looks at that man in the Sanhedrin and he assesses him. He assesses his personality as a hypocrite. He says, God will smite you, you whitewashed wall, you hypocrite. For you stand here to judge me according to the law and command me to be smitten contrary to the law. So he, he has his personality now. This guy is a, is a hypocrite. Well, somebody else stands up and says, oh, Paul, uh, do you know what you just did? You just reviled the Lord's high priest. Well, as soon as Paul recognized that that personality had a position, uh, he saluted the uniform. As soon as he realized that the guy had a uniform that didn't fit him, he actually uh, repented. He sort of condemned himself out of the law. He says, brethren, I knew it not, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of the rulers of your people. And so what we have to teach our children is that yes, we have to submit to people in positions of authority. And even if the if God has given them a uniform, even if uh, there are issues in the person's personality, in the person's character, there may be a time and a place to respectfully, to politely address those character issues, but we have to salute the uniform. We have to speak with respect and treat that person with the honor and respect that God says that person in position of authority deserves. And as I said before, this is something that the last couple of uh, generations just does not seem to understand. And this is something I think parents have to uh, really pray about and work hard to teach their children because it is so counter uh, to the culture that they're going to get bombarded in all kinds of subtle ways with this idea that says you only respect somebody if he deserves it. You only respect someone, uh, a person in position of authority and show him respect if he meets, passes your litmus test. Now, again, you don't have to respect his personality. You can understand the guy is, you know, whatever the biblical term is you want to use to describe the guy, but still God has given him a uniform and I have got to show respect to him. And if I have any hope of getting him to see that his personality, his character is wrong, if I have any hope of getting my authority to repent of his character flaws, uh, the only way I'm going to do that is by showing him respect, the respect that the Bible says I ought to show him. So you're respecting the position and not the personality. That is, uh, that is a, a key life lesson, I think, that uh, would go well yeah, yeah, that's, for all of us. And that's another thing. Yeah, and that's another thing you tell your kids because, I mean, for, through, for the rest of your life, and you can give examples, you know, from your own life. Through the rest of your life, you're going to have to be under somebody's authority in one way or another. It might be a government official. It might be your boss. It might be a family situation. But at the end of the day, you're going to, there are going to be lots of people in your life who, who, who are authorities over you in one way or another. And their personalities are not going to be commensurate with their position. But you must learn uh, how to respect their position, even if it's impossible for you to respect their personality. Okay, so... Take us now through how you might talk with a teen or, or a child for that matter to help them to identify um, their sinful thoughts and motives behind this disrespect that we're speaking of. Um, well, typically what I will do um, is 
uh, with, with my children or when I'm working with kids, I will first get them to, to understand on the surface what is disrespectful. I, I want them to make sure that they understand that the way that they communicated was, in fact, uh, and a disrespectful uh, form of communication. And then once they're convicted of that, then we'll start asking questions. Okay, can, can you tell me what you were thinking? When you said that to your mother, uh, when, when you uh, made that sinful gesture, what was going through your mind? And then I'll, I'll listen and I'll try to help them see at, uh, exactly, how their, um, exactly how their thought was or was not biblical. And of course, it's not biblical most of the time. And then after we talk about their thoughts, I'll say, now, what, what were you wanting? I mean, what was it that you wanted? When, when you got so angry, when you got so disrespectful, chances are there was something that you wanted that I didn't give to you. And because I didn't give it to you, and it may have been a good thing. I, mean, I may have sinned. I don't know. I may not have sinned. But at any event, there was something that you wanted, and I didn't give it to you. And because you didn't get it, you resorted to that sinful way of talking to me rather than just, you know, talking to me about what you wanted without sinning and, you know, making an appeal and seeing if you couldn't persuade me using uh, your normal tone of voice and proper biblical means of communication to give you what you want. So uh, in the book, in the book, Getting Grip, uh, I have this worksheet that, um, that children, teens can do to help them do a better job at identifying what their sinful motives uh, might be. Excellent. You know, one of the things I, that I was um, encouraged by, and I, and I also just want to, put it out there because it's important that, that we, that we recognize this. I mean, we're talking about disrespect and sometimes when you focus on the negative, it's hard to focus on the positive or you forget about it rather. Um, you, you wrote, don't forget to explain both sides of the put off, right. put on dynamic to your teen. That's right. That's right. Because again, you know, as Christians, what the Bible teaches is that we don't break habits. Unbelievers break habits. As Christians, we don't break habits. We replace sinful habits with their biblical alternatives. Okay. So the question we ask is, when is a liar no longer a liar? When he stops lying? No, he'll lie again. Liars don't always lie anyway. A liar is no longer a liar when he becomes a teller of the truth. Wherefore, putting away falsehood, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. When is a thief no longer a thief when he stops stealing? No, mm. he's just a thief between jobs. He's going to steal again. He's no longer a thief, according to the Bible, when he replaces his, dis, his thievery with generosity and diligence. Let him who stole steal no longer, there's to put off, but rather let him labor working with his hands, that which is good, that he may give to him who has needs. And so regardless of the sin, we as Christians don't just stop sinning. We don't just stop, you know, we don't just put off lust. We put on virtue. We don't just put off pride. We clothe ourselves with humility. We don't just stop being disrespectful. We make it our goal to be gracious. We make it our goal to speak with respect uh, to all people that the Bible says we ought to speak respectfully to. You mentioned that uh, you should instruct your teens to politely tell you and to ask mm -hmm. you for help when they become angry. Mm -hmm. So this this kind of yeah. goes right into what you were just saying. You're trying right. to help model what they can do. Can you talk to us more about how our teens should politely uh, talk to us uh, when they're becoming angry? Well, I mean, a lot of times we don't know that we're provoking our kids to anger. So what happens is we, we do something, and again, it may be a sin, it may not be a sin, but they get upset, all right? And so immediately they go into this maybe vindictive mode or frustrated mode, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is disrespectful. But if they would learn to just tell us the truth, to say, Mom, to say, Dad, look, I really want to have a good attitude about this, but I'm really upset right now. Would you please uh, help me by listening to me and helping me to explain what I'm so frustrated about uh, so that when we're done, I can at least understand that you that you understand, that you know what, I, what it is I'm trying to say to you. So it's a matter of teaching your children to, uh, to speak in a way that uh, communicates exactly what their frustration is. And, and so then would that also kind of play into how we can train our, our teens to make a, um, a biblical appeal? Well, that is, that is really a, a part of it. Yes, there's a, I think there's a whole chapter in my book about how to make uh, an appeal. But right, you know, it's, it's a matter of 
learning how to take no for an answer, learning how to make an appeal respectfully, learning how to, to, to express your frustrations to your parents without sinning. And there's nothing wrong with a, with a child, especially a teenager, uh, confronting their parents with their sin. There's a chapter in the book, uh, how to, uh, what's it called? Uh, hold on a second here. Oh, how to talk to your parents about their sin. I have a whole chapter where I instruct teens the right way versus the wrong way to talk to their parents about their sin. I mean, why does Matthew 18, 15 not apply to children and their parents? Why does Galatians 6, 1 not apply to parents, to children towards their parents? Why does Luke 17, 3, if your brother sins, rebuke him, not apply to parents? to children whose parents sin against them on a regular habitual basis. It does apply to them. The difference is, or the, the, the important factor is, when a child talks to his parents about what's frustrating them, about their sin, he must be especially careful to do it with a meek and a quiet spirit, to do it gently, and to do it respectfully and politely. You know, I'm thinking, um, I, I, I do have two teenagers right now, and uh, more will, will come, And uh, but I... I I'm thinking about the younger kids. What can I start to do as a parent that is going to maybe help to prevent a lot of the stumbling blocks that lead kids down into the disrespectful path? Um, boy, that's a great question. Um, I think first, the first thing that comes to mind is do what you can not to push their buttons, not to provoke them to anger. When they come to you and confront you about your sin, be very quick to acknowledge it, to ask for forgiveness. Make sure that you model respectful ways in your in your case, brother, that you, you talk respectfully to your wife, uh, teach her to talk respectfully to you. Um, and then I think, again, as I said before, in today's culture, this is this respect thing is so countercultural. I think you have to preemptively strike against it and you have to, from time to time, uh, talk to your children about respect and what it looks like and um, how they can show respect even when they're disagreeing with, even when they're confronting, even when they're challenging, even when they are rebuking someone in positions of authority. See, a lot of times kids think, well, okay, he's my authority and I really can't talk to him. I can't confront him. I can't, you know, he's dad or he's mom or he's such and such an authority. And they think, well, respect means I can't talk to them about their sin. Well, no, it's not what it means. There's a, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. But it's just a lot easier sometimes to keep your mouth shut, not to do the hard work and effort to learn how to convict someone, how to confront someone biblically, and just to sort of pop off at them. You talk about how we should remind our children that they will not always have to obey us, but they will always have to honor us. Yeah, that, that, gives, them, that gives them hope. It's like, in other words, look, someday you're going to leave and establish one family with the Lord. You're going to establish a new decision making. You won't have to be the head of your own home. You won't have to obey us anymore. You leave and you cleave, and you won't have to follow our instructions anymore. You can take our counsel. Uh, I, I will no longer relate to you as an authority person, but we'll be more like friends or brothers and sisters in Christ. But the Bible says, even though you won't always have to obey me, you will always have to honor me. So that's something you, know, you better get used to because you're not going to ever be in a situation where it will be right not to honor you. And even when you get old and even when you no longer have to obey me, if you dishonor me, uh, the curse of the scripture, as it were, is going to be upon you. There will be consequences if you don't honor me. There will be blessings if you do honor me. So you can be thankful for the fact that someday you you will you won't have to follow my instructions, but you will always have to show me the respect and honor that the Bible says uh, I ought to be given by you. Okay, a couple more points I want to hit, and, and then we're going to go to our Q&A. So for those of you that are still with us, we uh, would uh, pray that you would uh, send us some questions uh, in the chat box. Um, you also wrote, and I thought this was good, and it's so very important, encourage them to be thankful for the fact that you love them enough to do what you believe is best for them. Yeah, uh, a lot of times, again, in our culture, it's sort of like love is giving people what they want. If you love me, give me what, they, what, what, uh, what I want. Well, that's not the biblical view of, of love. I mean, the disciples didn't want the Lord to go away. He told them he was going to be leaving, and, um, and uh, you know, did he say to them, oh, well, okay, if you want me to hang around for a couple more years, I'll ask the father. Uh, we're, we're losing. 
and it, okay. it, it, it hurt it hurt them and so love is giving people what they need not necessarily what they want and so you may be disappointed that your parents didn't uh didn't uh, uh are not always able to give you what they want but if they're believers and they're showing you love they they're disciplining you they're they're trying to bring you up in the discipline and instruction of the lord because they whether you agree with it or not they're doing what they think is best for you that's good well uh, hopefully our internet's going to continue here um Last point that I'd, I'd like you to hit before we uh, move into the, the Q&A and to the next session here. Um, remind them that by honoring their parents, they will be blessed according to Scripture, but by dishonoring their parents, they will be cursed. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty sobering thought. But uh, in Genesis 2, I'm sorry, Genesis 9, 22 and 25, and Proverbs 30, verse 17, we see that there are consequences. You know, in the Old Testament, when a child was disobedient and rebellious, the parent, uh, the parents would take them to the elders of the city, uh, and the, the elders would examine them, and they would stone the children. I mean, it was a capital offense to, to be rebellious. Uh, and so there is a blessing, as I said before, and a curse associated with honoring your father and your mother. We need to keep that in mind. There's always uh, there's always the negative, and there's and there's the positive. So, um, right. uh, Lou Priolo, thank you so much uh, for uh, helping us with the challenge of the disrespectful internet, <laughs> and uh, thank you for the challenge of, of 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 helping us to parent our teens biblically as we work with the disrespect the disrespectful teenager and child, for that matter. Thank you so much for taking time out to equip and encourage our audience in this area. Our audience, of course, which is is live with us tonight and uh, holding on uh, despite uh, all the glitches that we're going through. Thank you guys for hanging out. Um, and then we also just want to tip our hats to those of you that will catch this in the days, months, and years down the road. We hope that this has been um, an encouragement to you as well. Speaking of our live audience, before we start fielding questions from them, um, Lou, go tell, go ahead and tell us how people can learn more about you and what you have to offer and the uh, best way to, to get your books. Yeah, thank you. Uh, probably the best thing to do. I mean, you can get the books on Amazon. You can I have a web page at Amazon, but uh, I've got recordings that are not available on um, on Amazon. So probably the best way to get the, the most of what I have uh, written and spoken about is to go to my website, loupriolo.com. And there's all kinds of uh, links and uh, things for you to look around to see if there's something I've written or spoken on that will be helpful to you and your family. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we, of course, will have that link in the show notes. Um, well, Lou, we're going to give you a bit of a breather for just a moment here because coming up okay. next, uh, we're going to move into our Q&A session with our live audience. So live audience members, uh, those of you that are still with us, now is the time, if you haven't done so already, to get your questions in. But... First, we got a little commercial break, and uh, I mentioned that Mr. Priolo was one of our distinguished speakers at the Christian Heritage Family Relationships and Parenting Conference, which is a brand new conference for Christian Heritage, by the way. And what I thought I'd do is uh, bring on our producer, Danny Craig, on the show here for a brief moment to tell us more about it, because not only does he produce this show, but he's also coordinating this event. Danny, are you there? Yeah, my internet's hanging in there. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. So tell us a little bit about okay, the Family Relations Conference. Yeah, well, we'll keep this brief. Um, one of the things that we did last year in 2013 was send out a survey after the conference, after April conference, and uh, we said, okay, what are some of the main topics that you all as Christian Heritage families are interested in hearing about? And we put things out there like encouragement for moms, encouragement for dads, uh, child training, uh, worldview, apologetics, all those different kinds of things, homeschool nuts and bolts. And uh, the number one topic was family relationships and parenting. So we thought to ourselves, oh, that sounds like a good conference title. Uh, plus, we had been thinking about the fact that you know we're all on board with the homeschooling vision. We like the idea of discipling our kids. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we all realized that bringing kids home from public school for five or six or seven more hours in a day doesn't necessarily make family relationships easier. In fact, in some cases, it can actually up the ante a little bit. 
And so uh, in order to help families at a deeper level, we thought, well, let's do an entire conference specifically on family relationships and parenting. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is uh, brought in some speakers that we think can really help us go uh, deep with some of these issues, uh, like our guest tonight, Lou Priolo, Greg Harris, uh, Craig Houston, who's a local pastor, uh, and Joel Beakey, Dwight Cover, among some other speakers. Uh, we'll be covering topics like uh, secrets to building God's kingdom through family relationships, a godly marriage, the foundation of family unity, a proactive parenting, how to train your child's character, sibling rivalry, turning competitors into a dynamic team, uh, the fifth commandment, what it is, why it matters, uh, waging and winning the war against conflict in your home. Uh, in fact, uh, just before we kicked off this broadcast, uh, Mr. Priolo was telling us a little bit about uh, a new book that he's got coming out on that topic. So hopefully we'll be able to get some content from him on that. And then uh, one of the things we want to do is not just do the, the upfront uh, keynote presentations, but also do some interactive panel discussions uh, with families who have been there, done that, haven't necessarily done it perfectly, but by God's grace are working on uh, family relationships. And so uh, you'll be able to talk with parents and even young people who are working on relationships with their parents, working on relationships with their siblings. Uh, just a quick note on pricing, regular pricing. Uh, we're doing this as a family price, $149 for the entire family, and then $45 per individual. Uh, but right now, we're doing an early bird special. We're about four months out from the conference, and the first 100 families uh, who register will receive a family price of $125, uh, which is discounted there uh, with a good little uh, discount. Uh, most of those spots are taken, so if you still want that discount, hurry up. Uh, get over to ChristianHeritageOnline.org. And believe it or not, it actually includes a free pizza party. So, I mean, what could be better than that? I don't come know. to the conference. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you, have a, when you have a family of eight, uh, that's 125 right there. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's yeah. Anyways, um, if you have disrespectful teens, uh, this is one feature of the conference they might not be able to turn down. Anyways, uh, that's the Family Relationships and Parenting Conference. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Okay. October 10, 11, 2014, Ocean Shores. And um, should be a, a great time. Thank you, Danny. Get back in your producer chair there and get us some questions. Um, I also want to point out the uh, Homeschooling Start to Finish seminar is coming up, which uh, also has the option of enrollment. And this is brand new, enrollment in the parent qualifying course. So if you are investigating or beginning homeschooling, you want to reevaluate, refresh, and tune up your current approach, or maybe you need inspiration and encouragement in dealing with all the details that go along with homeschooling, which may include if you need to meet the Washington State homeschooling requirements as an educator, then this seminar is just for you. And it's a 10 jam-packed hours of instruction, thoroughly exploring the nuts and bolts of the homeschooling adventure. Better hurry, though. June 11th, 2014 is the deadline, and it's fast approaching. Um, so you got to get in. There are two seminar locations and dates in the latter part of June for this. So uh, you can find out more information, of course, over at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. And then lastly, um, just a plug for Christian Heritage On Air. We're back live on August 5th, hopefully with a really strong internet connection. And Pastor Craig Houston will join us. And it just so happens, as Danny was saying, that he, too, is one of the speakers at the upcoming Family Relations relationship and parenting conference. So be sure to join us for that. Okay. It's time now for a Q&A with Mr. Lou Priolo on uh, how to deal with disrespectful teenagers. Let's see what questions are coming in. And um, is it ever necessary or productive to remove sc screens? Okay, I'm sorry. Is it ever necessary or productive to remove screens? I, I'm assuming like screen time from a teen is, is this something that, that is even effective or would it be fodder for more disrespect? Well, I think the short answer to that question is yes. Sometimes it's, uh, it's necessary, if not to totally to remove it, to, to set a limit on the amount of time that a, well, I mean, that, that a teen spends in front of the screen. Now, again, there are probably some screens that in certain circumstances um, – need to be removed at least for a period of time you know jesus said if your right hand offends you your best hand cut it off and throw it from you it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish and your whole body should be cast into hell if your right eye your best eye offends you pluck it out and cast it away from you it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish and that your whole body should be cast into hell so yes even jesus said sometimes we have to radically amputate at least for a period of time the things in our life that tempt us to sin Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. 
And so it is necessary sometimes for parents to remove or minimize the amount of um, exposure that children have to temptation until the child uh, demonstrates that he has enough self-control to, um, to govern it himself and to say no and to walk away and to, uh, to make sure that the things that he's viewing on the screen are uh, not having a negative influence on him. Okay, here's the next question, uh, Lou. When you've punished and taken away all you can and nothing seems to help get the kids better, what can a parent do? I wish I had three hours to answer that question. Um, I will, first of all, first of all, uh, if you think that punishing is going to correct your child's problem, you don't get it, okay? It's not the punishing that is the silver bullet. The Bible says, the rod and reproof give wisdom. You know, I'm a counselor. I counsel people um, for a living. And when people that I counsel don't do what the Bible says, I mean, I can't take them over my knee and spank them. I have to rely on teaching, conviction, correction, and discipline, training, and righteousness. And so the issue with teenagers especially is not – the focus isn't on how to punish them. When, when there are issues in a family with one child or more than one child – and uh, the issues are not getting better by the normal means of, of discipline or correction, then what parents may have to do is after the discipline has been administered, then to sit down and to spend extended periods of time uh, with the child, maybe as a family or individually, using the scriptures to teach, to convict, to train, and to correct in righteousness. So I just want to, first of all, make sure that we understand uh, punishing is not the silver bullet. The scriptures are the silver bullet, okay? You've got to be able to unpack and unfold uh, for your child what the scriptures say about their particular behavior and teach them how the Bible says they ought to change. Now, of course, we're talking about believing children. Of course, if they're not believers, then we have to evangelize them again, but we need the scriptures to do that as well. Now, so, so let's just suppose you, you've done all of that. Well, um, sometimes when, when I've gone through everything with uh, a parent and they have not um, been able to be successful, I'll encourage them to go to their church. You know, I, I mentioned before in the Old Testament when a child was rebellious, right? Uh, what did they do? They, uh, the church, the elders of the church would stone the children. Well, you know, we don't stone our children, thankfully, uh, in this day and age. But we discipline our children, and we, the elders can, uh, can use church discipline uh, as a means of trying to uh, help their children, help the children in the congregation. And discipline doesn't mean necessarily kick them out of church, excommunicate them. There's a, there's a four-step process that involves a lot of time and a lot of shepherding on the part of parents. But at the end of the day, if you've tried everything and, and, and things are not getting better, you haven't used all of the cards in the deck. You haven't used all of the biblical resources at your disposal uh, until you've tried to get the leaders of the church to come alongside and to help you and to use the resources of the local church to uh, reach out and minister to your child. The three most important resources in all the universe are uh, the, word, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the local church. I, I, I wish I had time. Like I said, I mean, I could tell you stories of, of our church where um, where we sat around the table as elders and just pled with uh, young people uh, after spending hours and hours and hours with them individually to do the right thing and to see how God has uh, often used that to bring about uh, repentance mm -hmm. in the life of the child. We have a lot of questions that are just pouring in and we're going to try to do our best. And so um, with that in mind, let's try to keep our answers as, as short as possible. And obviously maybe the, the, be the better answer is to come to the family relationship conference yeah, but, and then listen to Mr. Priolo for like six hours. Um, here's the next question. When a parent, um, excuse me, when, when, a, a, when should a parent seek outside help? I can't read. <laughs> um, 
you know, the Bible says there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. So, uh, I mean, basically, if you consistently run into a problem that you don't have an answer for, you know, you, you, you've looked in the scriptures, you've, you've tried to figure out what God wants you to do, and you, you, what, you're, what you're doing doesn't seem to be working. Uh, outside help, to me, is, uh, as I said a moment ago, something as severe as getting the leadership of the church involved or as uh, as simple as picking up the phone and calling someone in the church and say, look, I need some advice, I need some counsel. Uh, can I run this by you and get some thoughts as to what uh, I might be able to do to do a better job at parenting? So basically, if you don't have, uh, if you have a persistent problem and you don't, you've run out of uh, uh, what, what, what you believe are biblical means of dealing with it, then it's time to get someone else to help you find biblical solutions. Next question. When dad is the one provoking our teen boys and will not listen to mom's words of wisdom, what can mom do? Uh, you, you want a short answer to this question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> She has to make sure that she gets to be man of her own eye first, of course. She has to make sure that the appeals that she's made to her husband uh, are with a meek and a gentle spirit. She has to try to get her husband behind closed doors and to appeal to him. Uh, but at the end of the day, if he's a believer, uh, I would suggest what she would do is to encourage him to talk to somebody else in the church, somebody else who can maybe give him advice, perhaps even hold him accountable. Mm. Um and it may be a situation where she has to say to him, honey, look, I'm really, really concerned about this. Things are getting worse. Uh, you know, I really think I, I may be wrong about this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But would you be willing to go talk to Pastor Stones or Brother Stones? So just tell him what's going on and, and see what he says about it. I, I think basically she needs to try to appeal to him himself. And if not, if he's unwilling to, to listen to her, then if she really thinks what he's doing is a sin, and it's habitual and it's perpetual, then I think she has the freedom to basically encourage him to go to someone else in the church. And if he's unwilling to do that, she may have to go over his head and talk to some of the leadership in the church to get some advice on how um, how she ought to respond to her husband and uh, how she ought to uh, better manage her responsibilities as a mother and a wife. All right, here's a question you should be able to, to rattle an answer off to. How do you present the book Getting a Grip to Your Teen so that they would be interested in reading it? Um, well, this, uh, this won't work for everyone, but uh, it works for most people. You say, well, look, I heard this guy on the radio, on the internet, and he's written this book, and it's a book written to teenagers, but it's about anger. And the truth is, you know what? I got an anger problem, mom's got an anger problem, your brother has an anger problem. I'm thinking maybe what we should do is sit down and read this together as a family. Um, you know, or if not, then you might want to take the child aside and say, look, um, would you be willing to read this book with me? You can read it on your own. I'll read a chapter, you read a chapter, and we come together and do it together. I mean, as a parent, you're going to want to read this yourself because you're going to want to understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you know, especially like what I talk about, you know, hey, your, your, your children, if they do it right, can talk to you about your sin. I mean, you, you want to know what I say before you turn this book loose on your kids. Uh, what I say about teenagers, how we should see them as really as a, more adults than as children. So I would pitch it to them from the perspective of this will be good for you and this will be good for me. All right, very good. Um, how can parents be humble with teens and asking for forgiveness for sin when the teen strikes out at the parents with that information later, uh, there is no safety with vulnerability in the relationship. Well, you don't just confess your, your sins to your kids. You ask them to forgive you for them. And once they have said, yes, I forgive you, they're forbidden biblically to really bring it up and use it against you in that way. And so what you do is you say, now, look, that happened four weeks ago. I very clearly, very definitively told you that I was wrong. I asked your forgiveness, and you told me that you forgave me. Now, you're breaking your promise. When you forgave me, part of that promise of forgiveness is that you will not bring it up to me again. If I've done something since then uh, that was wrong, then by all means, you can talk to me about that. But it's wrong for you to bring that up because I asked your forgiveness for me, and you granted me your forgiveness. Okay. Um, last question. Right here. Okay. 
when a teen does talk disrespectfully to me, how do I respond to this teen at that moment? <laughs> the Bible says the heart of the wise studies how to answer. It ponders how to answer. Um, it, it, it's going to be a matter of practice. Uh, you may be able to say something. You may have to say, you know what? Um, I'm struggling right now with uh, anger. So I'm going to think about what to respond. I think what you said was disrespectful. Uh, I think you need to spend some time thinking about what you did wrong. You need to ask my forgiveness. And so basically, if you don't have enough self-control, you just need to say to your child, look, um, I need to think this through. We'll come back in a few minutes or maybe in the morning or whatever, and we're going to talk about this. But right now, I think I'm probably too angry to uh, say anything else to you other than you've sinned, you're disrespectful, you need to ask my forgiveness as quickly as possible. And then to spend some time thinking about it. In the in the um, in the book, I actually have a worksheet that will help parents learn how to do this. But the point is, the more you study, the more you learn your child and the particular disrespectful uh, manifestations and manipulative ploys that he uses, the easier it will be for you to think on your feet and for you to be able, in the moment, to give a, an appropriate answer. But the bottom line is you have to study, you have to learn how to do it. And in time, you should become more proficient at being able to put a stop to it. And if you do it right, um, it really will be effective. Uh, Proverbs says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you'll be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So you want to learn how to respond to him in a way that he realizes that he's being foolish and disrespectful. Lou Priolo, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and thank you for uh, putting up with the internet glitch and all. And what a blessing this has been, though. We look forward to seeing you this fall at the upcoming Christian Heritage Family Relationships and Parenting Conference. As we wrap up, I'm going to give you one, one last chance here. Uh, give us a final yeah. thought when it comes to dealing with disrespectful teenagers. A final thought. Um, I think you need to realize that it's something that is inherent in the culture. It's something that all children are going to struggle with just because of the power of influence. And the most important thing is uh, try very, even though it is personal, try not to take it personally and to remember that you're a shepherd. You're not in a fight or a contest with your child. All right, Lou, thank you so much for joining us tonight. What a blessing this has been. And like I said, um, we look forward to seeing you at the upcoming conference. All right, everyone, that music is a sign that this episode of Christian Heritage on Air is coming to a close. Once again, thank you to our guest, Mr. Lou Priolo, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. You can find out more about Lou Priolo over at loupriolo.com. And as a reminder, Mr. Priolo will be at the upcoming Christian Heritage Family Relationships and Parenting Conference, like I just said, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to meet you in person. ChristianHeritageOnline.org is the website to get you dialed in and signed up. And I want to encourage you to keep in touch with us with your feedback and comments over at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. We're here to serve you as you move through your family discipleship and homeschool journey. Thank you again to our producer, Danny Craig, for running the webinar platform. And thank you to my wife, Carrie, for helping me behind the scenes here in studio. And thank you to everyone on the board for this fantastic opportunity to serve. So until next time, this is Dr. Thomas Lamar. And may God bless you as you diligently pass on a vibrant Christian heritage to your children for God's glory. Good night, everybody, and God bless. information on this Christian Heritage program, find them on the internet at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. This program is produced by Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington, copyright 2014.